this is a day you made, whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know the truth remains, this is a day you made, this is a day that the Lord has made. As we live his name, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. I will walk in faith, you will protect my way. Every work is good. This is the day you made. I am a child of yours. You are the one who saves. I am redeemed by love. And this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, come and rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Come and sing your praise, for the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. Soon is the day he will bring us home, and we have this hope, for we are his own. This is the day. Come and sing your praise, for the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. Soon is the day he will bring us home, and we have this hope, for we are his own. is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here on this beautiful day that we have together here in the church. And those watching online today, welcome. If you are a guest today, we're especially glad that you are here. We have uh, communication cards. Uh, that you can fill out along with the um, offering envelopes today. You can put those in the offering plate later in the service or give to Sonia or me after the service today as well. Also, there's QR codes on your bulletins today for both giving and for registration for prayer requests and information about the church. Several announcements for us uh, today that we have. Uh, tomorrow begins our week of Vacation Bible School here at your church. It's Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. You can still register. Uh, the decorations over in the Activity Center uh, just look fantastic. So thank you, Vicki Wilson and Helpers, for spending hours and hours here this weekend and prior times uh, setting up and getting ready. So that begins tomorrow night, and you can still register today. There's a QR code that you can use as well. Also, tomorrow night is a church council meeting, the regular meeting uh, for, uh, for June, and it'll be here in the church in the narthex, right out there, because 
every available space is taken up by Scuba Vacation Bible School. So we'll be here at 7 o'clock tomorrow night for the church council. Also, uh, on Friday nights, a busy week at the church, Friday night is our monthly fish fry at 5 o'clock, so come on out on Friday night, uh, and proceeds uh, for that will help Vacation Bible School for this year as well. So come Friday for the fish fry. On Saturday, uh, you'll see in your bulletin announcements, uh, next Saturday, out at TLU, the uh, Guadalupe Valley Habitat for Humanity will have a Build Better Bash uh, on that day. I'll be out there, so come out and join me. It's for all ages, by the way. There's no age restrictions, so come out for a family. There's tickets involved, which we'll have uh, for you, T-shirt uh, and a meal and some other things there. That is next Saturday. On uh, Sunday to June 30th, we'll have a Matthew 25 uh, offering here at the church, and there's also a potluck luncheon after church that day as well. Happy Father's Day to, to all and for all the fathers here today and watching online. And we'll have more about Father's Day just a little bit later in our service. And now we will gather our hearts and minds together for a time of worship. You will stand with me now. We'll sing together a praise song as we begin today's worship. We unite. <laughs> Rising up, your heart burns in us. Let justice fall, let justice fall. Setting captives free, calling us to be your hands and feet. We unite for your kingdom's cause. So that hope will fall over all. We unite for your kingdom sake. So that love will reign above all. You reign above all. You reign above all. Justice for the weak, for the least of these. Break our hearts. We unite for your kingdom's cause, so that hope will fall over all. We unite for your kingdom's sake, so that love will reign above all. You reign above all. You reign above all. Hear the heart of Christ with us. A call to a call to love. Hear the heart of Christ in us. A call to love. A call to love. We unite for your kingdom's cause so that hope will fall over So that love will reign above all, you reign above all, you reign above all. 
Join me now in our call to worship responsive prayer that is based on 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God of every thought and reality, the holy, prophetic, sustainer of community, we gather here today as your people, children of the good news. Assure us of your presence once again, that we may trust the mystery of life and growth as we gather in the name of our Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. Our hymn of praise this morning is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, a correction in your bulletin, hymn number 476. Let us sing together. to the presence of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, who gives us love, who gives us hope, and who gives us grace, and above all, peace. Will you share that peace with one another as you greet one another in the name of the Lord? Peace be with you. Peace with you. Happy Father's Day. It's time for our children's sermon. All the children can come and join me here at the front. Before octopi, there's more than one little little uh, literature there. 
So, uh, Octavia, I learned something about um, the, the octopus. Each, so each night there's a, a sea creature character theme that we're talking about, and you learn things about the sea creatures. It's wonderful about how God's creation works in the sea creatures. So each night there's a different one in Vacation Bible School that you'll learn a whole lot. I learned something by the story this week about Octavia and an octopus. Did you know this? So how many arms or tentacles does octopus have? Eight, yeah, that's where the word octo comes in. So uh, that is marvelous, eight. Now, uh, I don't know about eyes, nose, and the mouth. An octopus, I'm sure they have that in some sort of fashion. Here's something I learned. An octopus has nine brains. Did you know that? Not, you, did you know that? You know, I did not know that. I barely have one. Octopus has nine of these things. A central brain in the head, and then each arm has like a little mini brain in the arm that can tell the arms what to do. That's why octopus can do, like with the eight arms, different things at different times. I didn't know that. Did you know that? They have a mind of their own. Well, they have, they have nine minds of their own, I guess, at this point, which is kind of scary, but... Apparently, and what I've heard now in the research, octopus are very intelligent sea creatures. They can do lots of different things. It's marvelous. Not only do they have nine brains, a little brain in the arms of one there in the head, they have three hearts. Did you know that? Three hearts. Oh my goodness, I'm feeling so now insecure about my own life. I have one brain that sort of works. I had kind of a heart that I'd have to go to a doctor at times to make sure it's working. The octopus has nine brains and three hearts at different places in his body to help with the vascular system as the blood flow throughout, throughout the octopus. Did you know that? The octopus has nine brains and three hearts. Oh my goodness. And that's just a marvelous thing of how they adapt to their life under the water. Now, if I had to live my life underwater, I would need nine brains and three hearts for sure, and maybe huge amounts of lungs, too, to hold the air. I couldn't live underwater the way they do. But that's a marvelous thing. So each night at Vacation Bible School, you learn something marvelous about the sea creatures and how God made them. And in the fact that this is a marvelous thing for the week, that everyone, everyone belongs to God. A theme today that Pastor Simon is going to be uh, preaching and teaching us later in the service is about how God looks on the hearts of people to determine, to determine how we might be in life. Now sometimes in life, for instance, if I'm under the water and I'm in the sea with an octopus, I'm not going to outswim the octopus at, at all. The octopus is going to just flat out be, be, be swimming in, in the ocean and hunting and finding food. I, I'm not going to compete with the octopus. But, if we're on dry land, I'm pretty sure I can outrun the octopus. Even slow Pastor Dave here can outrun the octopus if we're on dry land. But he's not supposed to be running on dry land. I'm not supposed to be swimming without some special gear at the bottom of the sea floor. But that's how we're made. Now, we're all not going to be the fastest, the strongest, the tallest, the smartest, the most whatever it is in the world. But that's okay because God looks upon our heart. That is, how we feel and what we know in life and how we live for God. The best gifts that we have in life aren't just something that we can use with our hands or our feet or even with, with our, our, our bodies at times. The best gifts come from God. That is having a good heart, a heart of Christ, a heart of love and friendship and kindness and gentleness and joy. All these wonderful gifts. And that's what God looks for us and as they grow in our lives the more we can be friendly and kind and helpful and just loving Christ in every day with our families and with our friends and our neighbors and all the world. That's marvelous. Let's pray together. Dear God, we give you thanks for your marvelous creation, including the octopus and the amazing abilities that they have. We give you thanks for us and for the amazing abilities that we have in life, too. And we give you thanks, O oh God, that you look upon our hearts and that we can live for you each day. And when we do that, we can have the strength and we can have the abilities of everything that we need if we simply have that heart and mind of Christ in our own lives. Help us to live for you each and every day. In Christ we pray. Amen. Remember, boys and girls, how much God always loves you. There is 
Faith Factory Sunday School this morning and with a nursery you can see your leaders in the back and parents you can go to the education building next door after church to pick up your children. On this Sunday, we have together acknowledging that it is Father's Day here and, and around our country. We certainly want to take a moment uh, to, to thank God and praise God for our fathers and those who have been as fathers to us in all of life. So from your seats today, we have a Father's Day prayer litany that we'll do together. Sandy and I will lead this, and you'll join in in the congregation parts. We begin with this. Holy God, hear this prayer for our fathers, for fathers everywhere who have given us life and love, that we may show them respect and love. For fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends support and console them. For men who may or may not have children of their own, but act like a father to someone in need of advice, support, nurturing, and love. For stepfathers who have assumed that role with love and joy, who have loved the children of another as their own and created a new family. For adoptive fathers who have heard the call of God to lovingly step forward for those that need their care. For fathers who have been unable to be a source of strength who have not responded to the needs of their children and have not sustained their families. For fathers who struggle with temptation, violence, or addiction. For those, for those who, who do, do harm and, and for, for those, those whom they, they have harmed. For new fathers, full of hope. For longtime fathers, full of wisdom. And for the fathers yet to be and the fathers soon to be. For those that have shaped our lives without claim of family and kinship. All those who have taught us, us guided, guided us, us, shaped us, and, and molded, molded us into servants of Christ our Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. One of the great things I'm always thankful for, eternally thankful for, as a father in my own life who the, the most precious gift I believe that my father taught me was simply how to be humble and kind and loving of people and forgiving. And it was a marvelous gift that he had. I've always tried to walk in those steps in my own life, and I thank God for my father each and every day. In our prayer concerns today, we have several that are in our a prayer list that you find in your bulletins uh, for this week. Uh, one person I want to mention uh, specifically today is Mike Booker. That's the brother of Lynn Borman who has been in, um, in under treatment for quite some time and has some trouble uh, finding some resolution. But he has had that uh, recently, and he's in rehab now, which is a big step for them. So we want to pray for Mike today and for Lynn and all of his family as well. You see the other prayer requests that we have there today. And for the many prayer concerns that we have on our hearts and our minds today and in all our days, we, we worship and serve a God that does indeed hear our prayers every day and every moment. And that's how we live our lives, that in the spirit, that of, of a prayer life with God. For that, too, we are eternally grateful. Let us pray together. Oh, holy God, we give you thanks for this time and place that we've come here to worship, a place that's been here for generations. And we've come here today, oh God, to acknowledge you, indeed our God, to worship you, to put away for these few moments of our lives perhaps other, other thoughts and feelings we have that keep us from your presence. 
Help us to know that you are here with us. Help us to acknowledge your love for us and grace for us and for the world each and every day. Help us, O Lord, to strive each day to live into your great expectations for us in life, knowing that at times that we do not, that you're there to forgive, to help us on a new way, a new journey of life. Help us to face all the, the troubles that we have each day. Help us to enjoy the celebrations that we have each day. And through times of difficulty and times of uncertainty, we know that you are there. You've always been there. I pray, O oh Lord, that we'll simply be found to be faithful, faithful to you as we know in the life of Jesus Christ and through the Spirit and through all of our prayers each day, O oh Lord. May we always have in our hearts and minds the prayer that Christ has taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn today is to prepare our, our hearts for the giving of our offering in a few moments. It's one of the great, great hymns of faith sung by many churches and Christians for centuries around the world. It is great is thy faithfulness. Beautiful words. May the words penetrate our hearts today and we think about these in our living. Let's stand and sing together.
Please be seated. Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Dear God, give eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts and minds to understand your word. Amen. I'll be reading from the message version of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, chapter 15, verses 34 through chapter 16, verse 13. Samuel left immediately for Ramah, and Saul went home to Gibeah. Samuel had nothing to do with Saul from then on. And though he grieved long and deeply over him, but God was sorry he had ever made Saul the king in the first place. God addressed Samuel, So how long are you going to mope over Saul? You know I've rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your flask with anointing oil and get going. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've spotted the very king I want among his sons. I can't do that, said Samuel. Saul will hear about it and kill me. God said, take a heifer with you and announce, I've come to lead you in worship of God with this heifer as a sacrifice. Make sure Jesse gets invited. I'll let you know what to do next. I'll point out the one you are to anoint. Samuel did what God told him. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the town fathers greeted him, but apprehensively. Is there something wrong? Nothing's wrong. I've come to sacrifice this heifer and lead you in the worship of God. Prepare yourselves, be consecrated, and join me in worship. He made sure Jesse and his sons were also consecrated and called to worship. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Here he is. God's anointed. But God told Samuel, looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. I've already elim eliminated him. God judges persons differently than humans do. Men and women look at the face. God looks into the heart. Jesse then called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel. Samuel said, this man isn't God's choice either. Next, Jesse presented Shema. Samuel said, no, this man isn't either. Jesse presented his seven sons to Samuel. Samuel was blunt with Jesse. God hasn't chosen any of these. Then he asked Jesse, is this it? Are there no more sons? Well, yes, Jesse says, there's the runt, but he's out tending the sheep. Samuel ordered Jesse, go get him. We're not moving from this spot until he's here. Jesse sent for him. He brought in the very picture of health, bright-eyed, good-looking. God said, up on your feet, anoint him. This is the one. Samuel took his flask of oil and anointed him. With his brothers standing around watching, the Spirit of God entered David like a rush of wind. God's vitally empowering him for the rest of his life. Samuel left and went home to Ramah. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Greek writer Asap said, Appearances are often deceiving, or looks are often deceiving. And according to minister and writer James Forbes, when people rely on surface appearances and false racial stereotypes rather than in-depth knowledge of others at the level of the heart, mind, and spirit, their ability to assess and understand people accurately is compromised. Samuel the prophet learns firsthand about the dangers of focusing solely on the appearance, the looks of someone, when he deals with the fall of King Saul, whom he had taken part in anointing as king of Israel. And to understand what is happening in this passage, we need to go back a bit. And I encourage you to read through 1 Samuel. It's a fascinating story. But we look back in 1 Samuel 8, and this is all about Israel's transition from a loose federation of tribes to its first centralized power under King Saul. 
The people demanded the political status quo. They said, we want a king like the other nations. God, Yahweh, did not want this. God was their king. And God knew the dangers of earthly kings and kingdoms, the greed, the corruption that often occurs because of untamed power, lack of accountability. God knew it was all too enticing for humans. The Lord at one point said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in relation to all that they say to you, for it is not you they have rejected, but me. They have rejected from reigning, from me reigning over them. Now then, obey their voice. And the people were granted their request. However, the prophet Samuel warned them first of the very harsh consequences to follow. The government would conscript their children for wars, make them domestic slaves, confiscate their land, and levy exorbitant taxes. Sadly, this prophecy will come true and remains thousands of years later. Saul had been chosen on God's behalf by the prophet Samuel to be king. Saul was described as charismatic, physically gifted, as well as extremely tall and handsome. Like any human being, Saul had character flaws and made mistakes. However, he was never able to own what was wrong, what the wrong he had done. When pointed out to him, he would not take responsibility. Saul disobeyed God time after time, and he became corrupt. When told of his misdeeds, Saul would confess his sin, yet his motivation for seeking forgiveness was driven by selfishness and by his big ego. He desired to always be the center of attention. For example, Saul said, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Honor me before Israel. Not honor God before Israel, but honor me. Yes, I've made mistakes, but honor me. Saul thought only of himself. He desired popularity, only trusted himself. He was blind to the fact that he brought upon the people of Israel the very thing Samuel had warned them about when they demanded a king. God regretted immediately making Saul king after he saw all the things he was doing. Something had to change. Saul could no longer be king. So God tells Samuel to stop moping. I love that. Stop moping about this. And go, we have someone new to anoint, a new king. God had a new king in mind, and it was time for Samuel to get going. And Samuel, we are told, is sent to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse. But under the guise of bringing about a worship time and sacrifice of a heifer under that guise so that he would not be found out by King Saul and be killed. And as soon as Samuel sees Jesse's first son, Eliab, he immediately announces that Eliab is God's anointed. Samuel is quite eager, I believe, to get this over with. But Samuel quickly learns of God's criteria for choosing the best candidate. God tells him, looks aren't everything. Appearances aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks or his stature. I've already eliminated him. God judges persons differently than humans do. The men and women look at the face and God looks into the heart. And after seven of Jesse's sons are paraded in front of Samuel, and not one of them needs God's approval. And Samuel asked Jesse, do you have any more sons? He does. But notice that Jesse seems hesitant. Well, the youngest, and he refers to him as a runt, 
and he's out tending the sheep. And once the youngest son is brought to Samuel, God says, get up on your feet and anoint him. This is the one. It is this youngest, the runt, David, who would eventually become the king of Israel, a descendant of Jesus. David would also make mistakes as a king. We read all about them. The successful times in King David's reign as king were when he was led, and he led from the heart. When he humbled himself and he obeyed God. When he admitted his mistakes and sought forgiveness, he would give to God his life and still knew that he would make mistakes. And when King David made one of the biggest mistakes, he prayed to God, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a spirit of integrity in me. Not honor me before Israel, but create in me a clean heart and renew a spirit of integrity in me. This story in 1 Samuel serves for us a great instruction for several issues. It's very deep if you dig in. One being that when we judge someone on their surface appearance, their looks, maybe what they earn, their money, their wealth, their popularity, how well people talk about them, or how they speak a number of things, we are not getting the full picture. That's what happened with Saul. He was strong and good-looking, and he was popular among the people, yet he cannot accept responsibility. He cannot be accountable. And it was all superficial. We have to go deeper, below the surface, as the statement from James Forbes that I read earlier Look at the level of the heart, mind, and spirit. And what are we told in the scriptures that we are to love our Lord, our God, with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our spirit, and all our strength? Look at the level of the heart, mind, and spirit. The second issue I believe it deals with is that God is the one who reigns over all. And God gets frustrated with the people when they want to have a king because God is the king. God created everything and everyone. And this is very important. God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus, chose Jesus, no one else to be our Lord, no one else to be the high priest, no one else to be the Savior, no one else to be a king. Saul and David as kings failed to obey God. And when they failed to see God as king, their lives, the king of their lives, they lost the ability to lead effectively. They lost the purity of heart. They lost the spirit of integrity. And thank goodness God sent Jesus to earth to redeem all of creation. Jesus brought us new life through his life. And what I know to be true from studying the Bible and in prayer with God is this. Jesus was God's only chosen one to send to earth to redeem and lead us. God sent God's only son, Jesus. Whoever believes in him shall not die, perish, but have eternal life. That true promise. Jesus was the one who was sent, who taught, who ministered, who healed, who died on a cross, and who was resurrected from the dead to give us all new life. I can't hear that enough. It is so vital to remember. To remember. And as Daniel Berrigan wrote in his book, The Kings and Their Gods, Quote, there has occurred an intervention of God for healing and reconciliation, an intervention named 
Jesus. An intervention named Jesus. God cared so much, loved us so much to help us deal with all our flaws and failures. And Jesus will return one day to reign over heaven and earth. And in the meantime, the most important thing that we are to be focused on in our lives is living out his gospel on earth. That is to be our sole focus, living the Jesus way. And as Christians, Jesus is our leader, our king, the only chosen one. No other intervention is needed but Jesus. The third issue that I read in this is bottom line, when we make the decision to follow Jesus, to live as Christians, we are called, we are called to be disciples, to love and lead from the heart the heart that's been given to us by God, to have a heart for God, to seek purity of heart and integrity of spirit. And will we make mistakes? Will we fall down? Will we fail? Absolutely. But yet, we can seek forgiveness. We can ask God to create in us a clean heart, a pure heart, and renew the integrity of of spirit. And a good question for all of us is this. In my life, am I working with God on the state of my heart, mind, and spirit? Am I working with God? Am I cooperating with God on the state of my heart, my mind, my spirit? Father's Day, like Mother's Day, is a good time to consider people in our lives that have been special to us, that have made a difference in our lives. Those people related or not, who have been faithful, supportive, and loving. The ones who have demonstrated the love of God. I think of those people in my life the living, and those who have gone on to be with God. Those who followed the call of God to lead from the heart, to avoid the trappings of greed, power, wealth, and selfishness. The least significant people can have a great impact for God's reign, God's kingdom. That's why God chose a lowly shepherd boy to be king, who for the most part would seek to serve God. And because Jesus sent, because God sent Jesus Christ, we no longer need to look for anyone else to lead us, to guide us. And we will recognize the intervention, the Spirit of God leading us, if we open ourselves up to that intervention. Let us be careful of big egos, selfishness, being hungry for power. Help us to only seek God's leadership, God's power, and to realize that Jesus is already intervening in our lives. Let us lead from our hearts where God is, God will give us the strength and the hope and the endurance and the grace. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, the story of Samuel and Saul and David is complicated. We are complicated people, oh God, yet you are with us and you intervene in our lives and you guide us, oh God. You speak to our hearts and to our spirits, and we ask, oh God, that we will open ourselves to your guidance, to your intervention in our lives. To not try to do things on our own, but to seek you, to lead us, to help us, how to respond, how to speak, when to be silent, when to share. But above all, may we focus on that gospel of good news, and create in us 
a clean heart, and renew the integrity of our spirits. It is in your name we pray. Amen. If you're able, please stand as we sing our closing hymn together. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, for worshiping with us. Remember this week, you can do something for this church. If you're not leading in Vacation Bible School, you can pray for Vacation Bible School. That's most important, to be in prayer for the teachers and all the leaders, the director, everyone. Above all, for the children, that their hearts will be open, that they will be ministered to this week, that they will be encouraged. It'll be a wonderful time to be around here and to celebrate the work of God with us. And also remember, um, and I want to make this announcement before I forget, Happy Father's Day. And on the way out today, the Women of Freedoms would like to honor all fathers here today as you leave. We are just popping to say Happy Father's Day. So as we go today, remember that God is with you, always guiding and leading you from the heart. Remember to strive to live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, and leave everything else to God. Amen. Just pop it. is my shepherd and he is everything I need so I will not worry I will not fear the enemy he says he loves me he said that he's with me even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death and still I know he has